Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you're very welcome to the Curious Coaches Club here on a Monday. I'm Jenny Cody, and I am with you with some fantastic guests for the next 60 minutes. Um, as we return to coaching, or prepare to at least in, the, in this uncertain time, there's never been a better time to look at how we adapt our coaching, our coaching practice to cater for the people who are in front of us. And in this case today, we're going to look and explore that with the guests we have around mixed ability. Um, I mean, we live in an incredibly and wonderfully diverse world and diversity being a strength for functioning and, and evolution in not just in sport. Um, so what I'd love to unpick today is just what those words mean to everybody that's here, a chance for all the attendees and everybody um, in our in our chat box today to share with us their thoughts around different um, experiences they've had, different groups they've worked with, and our guests um, to share, uh, I guess, the what, what what it means to them, why it's so important, um, the the word inclusion um, in our sporting world and beyond uh, covers ethnicity, ethnicity, gender, age, disability, sexual orientation, education, religion, and from my experience, it's that appreciation and value and respect that we have that supports um, everybody to have a sustainable, um, active, inclusive experience. So without further, without further ado, Louise, if I could come to you first. Um, as the centre picture here, can you just give us a snapshot of where you're currently at with your working and the experience you've had around this topic? Yeah, yeah. Um, so at the moment, I'm working with uh, people with intellectual disabilities um, with regards to adaptive physical activity. My background is um, adaptive physical activity for all, as, as you just mentioned there, Jenny. Um, I have a master's uh, in adaptive physical activity where I worked in South Africa with people who have been um, disabled through maybe a shooting or a stabbing or things that we just don't see here in Ireland really. Um, but my main, my main love for adapted physical activity is with people with intellectual disabilities, getting them included in their society, in their community, and some people are surprised when I say in their family. Um, so really just working with people with intellectual disabilities and helping them to become a happier, more confident person through sport. Fantastic. Thanks a million, Louise. Um, Esther, I have the privilege of working with you and I know the depth and breadth of your experience in and outside of work, but could you share briefly um, from your background and your um, love what, what this session today will mean to you and what you can bring to it? Yeah, thanks very much and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is uh, Esther Jones and my background is um, first and foremost as um, a disabled person and uh, 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 fortunate enough to become a, a Paralympic athlete. Um, that, that's my background and, and experience in, in sport and physical activity as a, as a person. Um, I was then fortunate enough to be able to work for, for UK coaching and, um, and share my experiences and, and my passion for getting more disabled people involved in sport. But I think from a personal journey, one of the things that I've learned as a coach is how much um, adapting for mixed ability groups and, and my background in terms of, of, of looking at how to include disabled people uh, has actually helped me become a better coach um, when working with non-disabled people. And what I've realized over the last uh, five, six, seven years is that actually um, the, the tools and skills that I've learned and, and grown up with as a disabled person, I've actually learned how valuable and, and important they are uh, when working with non-disabled people and, and all mixed ability groups and just the breadth of that and what that means. Wow, thanks Esther. I'm really looking forward to exploring that more in the next 60 minutes. Um, Paul, last but not least, uh, I know there's a, a scroll of things that uh, we can attribute to your depth and breadth of experience, but if you could snapshot that for us to let us know what, uh, what kind of environments you've worked in, that'd be awesome. Yeah, so I think um, probably when we're talking about um, inclusivity, I work for UK Coaching as a lead tutor um, and I work on the um, um, work, working around sort of inclusive um, tutoring um, and supporting coaches within their development. Um, I also tutor other types of qualifications for, for UK Coaching which consider um, sort of inclusivity within that delivery as well. Um, I think probably the, the greatest um, thing that I can probably speak about is the stuff that I do internationally. Um, so I do quite a bit of work internationally for the Premier League on their um, coach education program, which is working in a lot of sort of developing countries. Um, and I think it's definitely challenged me 
as an individual, and it probably touches upon what Esther mentioned earlier, really, where is, um, it's, it's definitely taken me out of my comfort zone over the last 10 years working on that program because you're having to um, adapt a lot of your own sort of personal delivery, either as a coach or, or as a trainer to develop other coaches, thinking about adaptations and making sure that sport's inclusive for all. Um, and yeah, just considering sort of the individuals within that, that um, they perhaps might go and work in either in a community-based setting or, or perhaps in a professional setting. Awesome, Paul. Thanks for the intro. And thanks, I guess. I'm really excited to see where we can next we can take this session today. Um, for those of you who haven't joined us or it's been a while, the, we have a game plan. We used to have a halftime oranges, halftime break, where we can really get a feel for the, the group, the audience that we have and where they're at in their understanding, what questions they'd like to be answered. And um, yeah, just having the privilege of having three guests here with that um, expert angle. Uh, so we'll do the first half. What does mixed, uh, mixed ability groups mean? And especially for our guests today to explore that and unpick it, why is it important? And um, take a break, engage with some questions, any question that we have particularly for anybody. And then the second half, we look at a model that we use inside UK Coaching and beyond. I'm sure uh, some people are very familiar with it, the step model and then sharing, which is the, the always the juicy part in the feedback for it. Sharing ideas and examples so people can contextualize, take it from here and actually start to plan if their sessions are coming up this week um, or over the next uh, the next month as we return to train. So, um, Paul, if I could come to you first, um, what does mixed ability groups mean um, for you in, in your world? And I know you have a couple of different hats on in, in the, the roles that you play, but what does it mean to you? What um, I think for me, it, it's it's talking about um, the word differentiation, um, and I think where we're we're starting to really um, focus on individual needs. Um, I think from my perspective within a coaching environment, I think in every session there's different groupings, and I think probably the easiest way to to try and um, um, summarise it is I think in a coaching session there's sort of three groups. I think you've got those that are kind of your strivers. Um, and uh, that are forging ahead and those perhaps within your group that are maybe coping with um, the tasks at hand that you've set them. And I think those that are perhaps um, uh, struggling to achieve the, the task set. And I think it's it's about thinking as a coach, how can you cater to support each of those three groups? Um, and yeah, depending on how many you're working with. So for example, and I, I might speak about this a little bit later on, in China, um, we're doing quite a bit of work with PE teachers there, um, and their biggest challenge is they, they tend to, um, as an individual teacher, work with perhaps 60 to 75 um, people in a class, which is a challenge in itself. And, and how do they look to be inclusive in that context and consider everyone within such a large group? Um, yeah, and that's where we've tried to do a bit of work around some of these kind of groupings and and banding levels really wow yeah wow 60 i mean i've only had a short stint inside a PE. I imagine 60 there oh gosh um louise if i could jump to you mixed ability groups in the in your world at the moment what, what does that mean to you you're on mute there louise sorry <laughs> thanks Hi guys, sorry. <laughs> um, well, mixed ability to me is a it's a challenge. It's exciting. It's um it's an opening for everyone, and I don't mean just the people with the disabilities in the group. I mean the the people that are mentors that are learning. As Paul said, there there's different groups of people in every um session that we do, and there's those strivers, and you think that when they're in the session, all they want is to be the best player today or the quickest player today. But when you mix in other people with other abilities and disabilities, um, it, it, everyone comes to a level playing field. Uh, a person that might be the most competitive player has now become a mentor for somebody on their team. And mixed ability is not just um, to bring the people with disabilities to the level of people without disabilities. It's to bring everyone to a level playing field and bring everyone together to achieve a great training session that everyone is included. I love that, Louise, and two of the words that were 
popping into my head uh, formulating that was the, the fairly and the equally words that we hear a lot around inclusivity. Um, and I guess one of the questions, Esther, if I could float to you on this one, one of the questions I'd have is then how, how do you, from either from your personal experience as a coach or an athlete, identify um, where you need to differentiate and where you need to tailor the sessions? What, what does that look like for you? Uh, yeah, interesting question. I think um, I think uh, one of the key things is obviously uh, to understand kind of what people people want and their motivations, and I think that has a, a kind of very uh, important impact on on how you might uh, mix and, and cater for different people. And I was smiling there actually because I was thinking about something that Louise said and something that had been put in the chat box there about actually how when I was a um, performance athlete, I actually used to work, uh, uh, used to um, really enjoy competing um, with um, mainstream uh, non-disabled people in athletics. And actually, you know, me um, as an elite athlete going to a county championships or a regional event meant that I had a really good level of competition with club level athletes but that pushed me as an international athlete do you know what I mean and it pushed me to get the times that I needed so you had a Paralympian uh, running alongside uh, you know kind of regional level athletes but actually that was a really good playing field for me to push me to be able to get the times that I needed and so it actually increased a lot of opportunities for me there so that was the thing I think one thing is in terms of looking at people's motivations and goals and what they're trying to achieve and that might be some of the way that you the, that you look at, at mixed ability groups as well but I also think going back to Paul's point about you know you've got people that are striving you've got people that are coping you've got to be very observant you've got to look at people and not only look at them in terms of physically how they how they're coping with a skill but actually what's the whole body language do they look like they're thriving with it do they look like they're losing concentration because it's too easy or do they look like they're really you know people are really not getting this at all and you can see body language changing and they're really getting demoted and that kind of thing so i think that kind of thing of just really being observant and and looking at uh, how things are landing um, as a coach is constantly something that we're all doing, I think, and we all need to do in order to make sure that we just keep that real kind of person-centered approach and it's a positive experience. Yeah, and you know, like I can totally relate to that, Esther, as you're saying it. And I wonder, um, in some cases, when you're immersed in the sporting world and you get a chance on a regular basis to tune into that and and upscale, if you like, um, uh, like is it easier said than done? Um, like I had a stint when I first moved to London, working across 30 different schools with PE teachers, and they were lifting the behaviour from the classroom straight into a PE hall or outside, and so they were trying to be observant, but the behaviour style and management didn't. Uh, it didn't change much and the, and the fear maybe their negative experiences were coming through and uh, there was a hesitancy to get into certain sports so I think what you've said there really resonates with me around being observant to the behaviors that, that you're seeing from um, from the participants now Paul if it was in China and there was 60 I don't know how superhuman people would have to be <laughs> scanning that whole room but um, if I could if I could go to kind of our second point um, and I know some of the easier answers are going to be on the tip of your tongue, but why is it important? I mean, we talk about understanding the individual as Esther's led us nicely to. Why is it so important to adapt these sessions? I think because we want to have people that are um, actively involved in sport and, and are involved in sport for, for the long term into the future and, and are, are our kind of long life participants in sport. Um, so I think by catering for, for people's individual needs, whatever um, they may be, I, I think it's about giving them that positive experience in sport, um, making sure that they do feel included, they do feel valued, um, and they are getting some sort of success. And most importantly, probably the word enjoyment, I think, is, is key, really, some sort of satisfaction from um, the activity that they're doing. So. Um, I think there is a danger sometimes as coaches that we go for this kind of blanket approach, one size fits all, um, and we don't kind of tailor enough our delivery to the individual needs with, within the session. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's that's really, really important. Yeah, thanks a million, uh, Paul, for that. We, uh, You've mentioned a couple of things there. Back, I think it was 2019, um, UK Coaching, 
commissioned YouGov to do a, a massive, massive survey. It was about 50,000 50, adults and 2,000 children engaged in giving us some feedback around their experiences of being coached. And as, you, as you've nailed it there, and I, I think, you know, we've, we've seen it a couple of times appear. The, the experiences of young people, and we're talking seven to 17, I think the bracket was between the younger and the older, was to help me get better came out, came out on top around their experience and the friendly approach of the coach. Um, and that, I mean, that for me is, if we can get our head around that in this space as a coach, you know, whoever we're coaching, whoever's in front of us, help them get better, understanding what better looks like and feels like to them and to, and, um, and that friendly approach. And the second one was uh, a question around qualities of a coach. And it was people skills, um, understanding me and my needs. So vitally important. So yeah, you've nailed you've nailed this already. You probably read that just before you came on, Paul. I'm sure you did. <laughs> just have a link to that if anyone's interested in seeing um, seeing some of the results. And there's some interesting um, results that came from that around 2017, 2019, and actually very little difference in the percentages of, of those kind of key ones staying on top. So one thing I'd, I'd be really interested to, to uh, tap into with you, Louise, is with the athletes. Um, and people that you you coach or you're involved in physical activity with, how do you um, how do you get a, a grasp on whether they've enjoyed the the session or what enjoyment looks like and feels like to them? Yeah, well, it it, it looks and feels the same for people with, with disabilities or um, as it would for 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 anyone. You know, they're they're happy. The, the, the the benefits of exercise are so well known, Jen, you know, and everyone knows those benefits of exercise. I'm not going to, we've only got an hour here. I'm not going to waste my time telling everyone the benefits of, uh, of exercise for everyone. And it's no different for people with disabilities. Um, I could have a, a severely disabled person in a, in a wheelchair, um, cerebral palsy, uh, non-verbal, um, and I could do motor activities as a Special Olympic sport. And, and by having the right equipment, height adjustable tables, ramps, you name it, and we are going to get into more detail in that later, but by having the right equipment, by having a smile, by having a competition, by, by just organizing something, you can see um, how this person is going to show how, how much they've achieved in this, uh, the physical activity that they've done. They don't need to run a lap of a track or they don't need to swim a length of a pool. All they need to do is just use their index finger or their elbow or whatever they need to just push that ball off that ramp and see it hitting all those pins. And you can see the enjoyment in that person's face. So it's not about becoming better or you know, achieving more. It's just about achieving that one thing. And as a coach, your reaction to them hitting those pins is what they're looking for. The congratulations, the cheers, their coach, other staff members, other coaches that might be there, and their their teammates, their peers. And as long as you can show that, you know that they, you've shown them that they've achieved. So it's it, there's so many ways to see enjoyment or achievement from a person with a disability without a disability and you know it's, it's just obvious mm, brilliant louise i love that and i'm going to take it straight to you esther um linking to joy's statement um question that i'd like to pose to you the beautiful side of that the enjoyment and engagement because i mean you're smiling and coming through the screen as you're saying that louise, louise and i've had the privilege of watching you work and coach and you know you're absolutely incredible at it so i get that same enjoyment when i'm coaching and engaging and giving feedback but that cost for performance uh, puts the pressure on esther from from your experience how do you hold on to that beautiful um, interaction and that kind of journey that you're on as the coach athlete or coach person when the pressures of performance come in. And you touched on it earlier on, but I'd love to, to know from your experience what you think. I think. I think it's really, really important that you don't lose sight. I mean, you know, I'm a very different person now than I was, you know, as an athlete. And as an athlete, I was, I was extremely driven um, as a professional athlete and extremely, um, you know, extremely kind of hard on myself in terms of it. You know, it was always about performance. It was always about, you know, getting better and, and meeting your targets. And, and obviously, you know, we had goals, we had uh, things that we wanted to achieve. And ultimately, it was about, 
you know, gold medals, retaining world records, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, it, that's a long, that's a long slog and it's a hard slog. And you look back now, you know, 20 years after being, uh, you know, retired and I'm going, yeah, there, there had to always be, you know, a little, you know, senses of achievement in there, feeling that I'm always, you know, progressing, but understanding. And I understood very much as an athlete how, I'm not quite sure what the word is really, how how honoured I was to be an athlete, not only because of what I was achieving, uh, you know, and the tangible things that I was achieving, the funding I was getting, but actually what that meant to me as a person and, and how that was helping me to develop as a person. And I know we talk about it a lot, but the confidence um, th that it gave me, you know, the ability to, to talk to lots of people, um, you know, the ability to support other athletes and, and you know, my passion in terms of being able to, to be a mouthpiece f for other disabled people. But the person that I am now, you know, came from all my sporting experience. And that is about, you know, some of the things that Louise spoke about there about actually, you know, developing your confidence, uh, you know, all that kind of thing. So, yes, it absolutely is about performance, but it's all about those other elements as well. Yeah. Brilliant. And I mean, I'm uh, thinking of the coaches that I work with uh, at the moment, and they're the kind of the, the top end of the pathway in regards to performance and funding, some on the path for what would have been Tokyo this year and next year. And I still speak to them about that, staying kind of grounded. And although you have a number of different hats and pressures to really see the people in front of you tap into motivations. And I know later on we are going to talk about uh, some of that in detail, but I think we've really captured where we're at um, as far as mixed ability groups and coaching and people and also um, holding on to that gem of the person in front of you throughout. Um, Paul, if I could jump to you, there's been a brilliant, um, Nicholas has popped in here and I'm very, very conscious that we are floating a lot of terms around here and maybe not nailing down the definition. Um, a number of terms are being used, mixed ability, inclusion, differentiation. Um, Paul, if I was to say kind of differentiation from my angle, differentiation leading to a more inclusive environment, uh, just from the different environments I've been in. Would you be happy to elaborate on your uh, um, thoughts around inclusion and differentiation? Um, yeah, I think in a, in a session, we all want to have kind of that maximum participation. So everyone feeling like they're, they're kind of involved in the activity and active. But I think when we sort of move to the word inclusion, those two can kind of get a bit mixed up at times. And I think um, where where we're trying to achieve inclusion within the session, for me, it's about looking at those individuals in the session and thinking about how we can start catering for their needs. So, um, and that, and how we look to, to try and assess that for me is, is looking at um, perhaps their ability to perform certain tasks, or um or activities that we're asking them to do or skills um so yeah differentiation for me is about um yeah looking at um starting to um assess their ability levels within um certain skills or technical functions or or other things that you're looking to achieve within the session um and i think nick um mentioned it earlier where we were kind of talking about um, and the ability can change from task to task. That's completely 100% true. So one week I could be um, sort of a high achiever, striving ahead in one task. And then I think um, the following week, if the task changed, I might be in the, the kind of struggling group. And I think it's down to the skill of the coach to try and um, manage those situations. And we're going to talk a little bit later on about a few sort of ideas and concepts that can help to support that. Okay, and Paul, thanks. And I hope that's given, um, given Nicholas and a few other people there an idea of, of with it. Um, I think you're, you've nailed it for me around um, my struggle and stretch, and it may not be always as, as rigid as those terms, but being able to observe, as we mentioned already, you know, the aim of the obsession, the core aim and the core kind of activity that we have is a, which we may, may give some examples of later, you know, what's two steps down from that if we're differentiating? What's two steps up? And it isn't about taking a small group and isolating, but what, how can we make everybody enjoy the event as fairly and equally and enjoy the experience by just making small tweaks and adaptations? And, you know, as again, the classroom side of things, um, that may mean if you ha are lucky enough to have an assistant in the class, 
um, you know, can you use an iPad to engage them athletes very quickly to look at a video to help them understand the breakdown if you have got a big class, if, uh, if it's beyond the 30. But um, yeah, that's, that's a really good insight. So we've mentioned a few times about later on, and I think we're coming just up to the halfway mark. And I'd really, before we introduce the step model in detail and engage with the uh, the five C's, which we're going to get into later in the meaty part. Um, if we could go to the chat box and just get an idea, um, the, the step model that we have spoke about a couple of times, space, task, uh, equipment, and people, and how we kind of use those to adapt and change a session. If I can ask people in the, task, in the chat box, have you seen the step model before? Have you used it? Um, and if you just take a couple of minutes and that, Joy, yes, kicking us off nice and quick. Brilliant, Joy. Brilliant. Yes, familiar with it, Sam. That's awesome. Thank you. No, Alison, no problem. You will be in about 11 minutes. You'll be nailing it and have notes and examples. Uh, I totally agree, Joy. Absolutely. Um, Joy's mentioned there that there's so much more to step. Absolutely. No, I haven't seen it. No problem. And that just give us a gauge here. Um, we are obviously, you know, recording all these and you can go back into layers. But what we've done is taken the step model. Esther's going to give us a little bit of an introduction to it um, in, a, in a couple of minutes. And then we're going to get Louise, Paul and Esther to go into some examples for each of the sections. So if you have heard it before, I'm sure the examples that will be used today will stimulate some different um, different ideas for you as you return to coach or support others that are returning to coach there. Um, before we move on, are there any questions from the chat box? Oh, really brilliant. Is differentiation, uh, Louise, would you mind answer this or I'll open it to Annie. Is differentiation always about improving skills of the individual once motivations have been established? What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I, I actually think this question would probably be better suited if we're talking about improving um, skills to, to Paul or probably Esther when she has been an elite athlete. An elite athlete. Um, for me, my um, interest is to get people involved. They're not necessarily going to improve. Um, they might feel more confident. They might gain um, greater self-efficacy from it. But for me as a coach, it's not about improvement. It's about enjoyment. Uh, encouragement and coming back, exercise and physical activity, and and that's where I am uh, in adapted physical activity. So, if we're looking at more elite athletes and trying to get people um, to improve their skills through adapted physical activity, I would hand it over to Esther if you don't mind, Esther. <laughs> Thanks for that, Louise. I think that's really important, Esther. Hi. No, it's an interesting question because I think absolutely um, you can use this set model to look at um, and, and this uh, models that we're going to look at to, to look at is this something that I can do to help um, develop somebody's skill. Uh, so skill um, both in terms of progression but also in terms of actually do you know what I'm really struggling with something do I have to break that down and, and relook at it so let's take it back a step as you've spoken about and, and relook at something and then build it up again but I also think as you said it is it is more about it, it is more than just skill development it might just be around you know I want to develop my my confidence I want to develop my tactical awareness on things I want to really understand uh, not only you know the skills but also you know look a little bit more at the tactics or how I might do something or how I might position myself yes it's skill related but it's also uh, looking at some of the other elements so that you have a greater understanding um, and I also think it can be um, used to look at how do we develop the people skills of others in terms of you know potentially looking at some leadership stepping forward doing a little bit of you know so there's lots of different things you can do with it so I don't just think it all, it's all about skill development but that's often where we go and it is a major part of of that as well. Yeah, brilliant. And, um, and Nick has, has um, nailed it there. It goes uh, across the full span, physical, tactical, psychological and social returns from the practice. Um, and any of the elements that we do look at here, they're not in isolation. In previous sessions, we have looked at um, you know, constraints in a session, boundaries in a session to encourage learners to emerge with different behaviours based on different constraints of the task or the person, the environment. But I think on a, a higher level, looking at the planning of a session and observing and connecting both of those throughout a session. Um, I think, you know, we can have as much planning as Louise says 
done as we want. But when we get into the observation of, oh, this isn't working, are we willing to go off piece slightly to just see what adaptations can be made? So yeah, great answers on that. And I, I completely agree. Returning, returning with smile on their face, enjoyable experience. Um, Esther, you were going to take us to a brief overview before Paul gets stuck into space and task for us. Would you mind doing that now? Yeah, no problem. Uh, just waiting to see if the model pops up. So we're going to we're going to take um, after the overview. Paul's going to take step and task, give us some examples and a layer in, and then Louise is going to look at equipment and people, just explaining kind of a little bit of the overview and then some examples. So we've got we've got a whole slide that looks at the step model on its own. Um, there we go. Okay, so the STEP model, it's a UK coaching's chosen model uh, to help coaches look at how they might um, alter their uh, tasks and activities um, to help um, people to um, engage in them uh, and to help um, not only engage in them but to challenge people but also potentially to help them to relook really at things as well. So um, this is a model that I I guess I first became aware of this model when I began to work for UK Coaching about 15 years ago and it was something that was in um, at the time one of our uh, How to Coach Disabled People workshops and we, we've still got that uh, workshop available but it was something that from an individual perspective although I hadn't seen the, the model before I, I very quickly recognised the different kind of adi uh, adaptions that you could make around space, task, e equipment and people so I very much kind of recognised those in my own personal experience but also in terms of uh, coaching as well and so it's been great to be able to to work through and talk through some of those with with coaches as we go and I found those conversations with coaches in this workshop kind of really rich around looking at how we would uh, adapt different elements of that so this is the model that we've we've uh, been uh, using for some time now what's exciting about this this model is that we're starting to see it uh, come into other learning and development resources as well uh, hence the fact that you know it, it's not just about in including and working with disabled people but it is a vitally important tool there awesome Esther Paul if I can jump to you uh, very quickly so space we had a chat last week and um, straight away straight away you got me smiling because any conversations I've had previously with people about space you were doing this <laughs> just like bigger just make the space smaller job done tell us more about um, the space part of the step model please and task if you want to ease onto that as well yeah so um, we use this quite um, heavily internationally and we we think that the step model is a great model for any coach to kind of have in their coach's toolbox I think when it comes to the word space in this concept though um, many coaches tend to just think about making like you say, Jen, the area bigger or smaller. Whereas um, I think it's a lot more than that. So it's actually thinking about the space within the space um, and what kind of things can you do with that space. So for example, there's just a few images on, on here and I've, I've probably done it a little bit from a, a football perspective because I'm kind of heavily from that kind of background, but this is very um, transferable to, to other kind of environments. So um, for example, it talks there about the space within the space. So what can you do to manipulate perhaps the, the coaching area that you're using to have certain stations or spaces? So for example, you if you, you're working maybe with um, uh, athletes that are perhaps rehabilitating or perhaps um, those that are, are just being re-engaged back into sport and are perhaps over 50, then you might have um, some spaces within your session where there's a bit of rest areas so people can actually move into that, that space and, and feel like they can take a break and not be so heavily involved in the activity um, and this can be for able-bodied and, and disabled body. Um, also spoke about kind of the space between equipment so how can you absolutely um, maximize perhaps the space that you're using so for example in this um, incident um, on the left hand side the, the first image if you've got a couple of um, players that are looking to drive between um, the gate there where there's the the red player what um, ha how have you kind of worked the space effectively um, so that the attacking player feels like they're getting some success in actually going past that perhaps defending player and being able to dribble and drive through that gate 
So the coach has got to get that kind of space right and appropriate to both kind of challenge, but also stretch the individuals. Um, and then it might also be thinking about kind of the space between players. So if you're setting up your, your coaching area, are you, whatever you're looking to perhaps achieve within your session, is it the right kind of space between those that are participating and active within that session? Because sometimes we might get it a bit wrong and then um, the outcome of the session isn't being achieved because we haven't maximized or effectively manipulate the space between players. Um, and then this is, is probably a little bit football specific, but also can, can be transferable across sports. I've just put there the space between the, perhaps the player and the ball. Um, so are we kind of um, considering that enough within both the, the planning of our session, the delivery, and also within the kind of review process? Because I think step um, can work across all of those three areas. Um, so yeah, it's not just for me about focusing on making the session larger or smaller. It's also thinking about space within the space and, and how you can kind of manipulate that effectively to, to achieve the outcome of, of what, whatever you're, you're looking to achieve within your session, be it football or netball or perhaps another type of activity that you're delivering. I think that's like a jump across there, Paul, very quickly. Um, I, I think that's really good for people to to pause and think about um, to incorporate in their sessions. But also, as Margaret has mentioned here in the chat box, um, uh, now that COVID restrictions will be in place, um, there'll be adaptations that will be mandatory and then adaptations to adapt the session um so i think you know when we're i know you've put down that you know there's a football here and, and you said it's football specific but i think as people are co coming to the forefront of the phased returns people are going like what you know what does that mean to me in my world if it is an innovation sport if it is an individual sport proximity to the athlete proximity to the equipment to each other and how does that impact the session the projection of voice um yeah the, the, the movement you have to room and uh to the room you have to move um, and as you were speaking there again I was thinking of you know PE <laughs> I was thinking of return the schools the adaptations in the in the school buildings you know, yards perfect while well, the weather's great but what what effects does that have on the the uh, physical education of the of the students and pupils and the pressures on teachers to then adapt their sessions so uh, brilliant brilliant visual there stimulated a lot um, if I uh, could jump to the task now, would you mind sharing your thoughts on uh, maybe some examples around task? Yeah, so task um, for me is about kind of the information that you give um, to your participants or players or athletes. So, um, and, and that can vary from, from kind of session to session. And it's also perhaps um, the uh, set rules or conditions that you set on the activity. Um, I think as we progress through a session, generally they tend to um, kind of increase because I think um, the key to, to starting off any session is about it being accessible for all, um, for sure. And, and, and Louise can probably ag agree with me on that, especially coming from yeah. uh, a disability perspective. So I think we then look at once people are accessible and accessing um, the activity that we're, we're putting on, a task is then a great way of kind of modifying the activity to make sure that we're perhaps catering for those groups that we spoke about earlier in terms of those that, that um, need that little bit more challenge or those that perhaps need a, a little bit more additional support. And can I stay on that for a second, Paul? If I was thinking about rules or changes in a session, how how would or what advice would you give on introducing that change? At what point and at what moment would you introduce that, and how? Yeah, so I think I think it's about um, not making too many changes too quickly, and there, there's a bit of a danger as a coach because we're we're kind of, uh, and I say this um, this quite often really is I think. Um, talking is is kind of silver but i think that listening and observation is gold and i think as a coach we need to step back and and actually make sure that we give ample time to um watch and observe and and listen to what's going on and then i think it's about 
finding the right moment and the right time to kind of step in and, and make those kind of um, changes to the task. Um, and those changes could be either with the whole group or it could be with perhaps smaller groups within that session or, or actual individual players. Because I think the key to inclusivity really for me is about those um, from, from um, yeah, a variety of different levels being able to participate all at the same time together in the one activity. Um, uh, yeah, it's not about for me sending one group off that's striving ahead on their own necessarily to go to, to one area of, of uh, the hall and another group that are perhaps not coping to, to go to one area. I think for me, it's, it's about trying to make sure that through changing the task or the space, or perhaps utilizing different equipment or manipulating the people, trying to make sure that everyone's still involved in the one activity and accessing it all together. Yeah, as you were speaking there, I was thinking about the, um, the components of like the understanding motivation and the self-determination theory. So the autonomy to control and choice and, and have that direction as an individual participant, but then also the competence so that that, that fine line of, of feeling that sense of achievement, but also belonging to the process, belonging to the, the session itself or the group. Um, so yeah, that fine line where the observation and the standing back, which is hard for some coaches, teachers to do, but then gives you a really big picture. And, and the more you practice that and, and become very self-aware of your presence in that, I think it can help. Um, can help the session and the participants in their level of enjoyment. So I appreciate that, Paul. Thanks for that insight. Um, I think Esther's, sorry, as well, I think Esther's made a really valid point, and we'll probably touch upon this a little bit later on, perhaps within the character of the C system, where we can actually give ownership to the young people once they've understood the step model themselves to make sort of the changes, um, the potential task or something else within the session to make it a better experience for them absolutely absolutely completely and and joy just to reiterate what joy said in the group there like the how part which i think you've just tapped on there paul just seeing and observing and then understanding you know how i'm going to introduce this when and where um louise if i could jump to you around equipment and people um it says there yes. just a type and size but yeah give us uh, some examples of different equipment you mentioned them earlier but i'm really interested to know yeah, I, I just listening to, to Paul there, I, I really, when I was doing my notes, I didn't put much emphasis on the S and the T. I was just looking because I knew I was going to be doing equipment and people. And it, it Joy made a comment earlier that it's so much more than the step system. And I actually believe that we could speak about the S for an hour, the T for an hour, the E for an hour, and the P. And now I'm, you know, what information do you give? And really I think it's something that we could go into so much depth on so for now I'm just going to say the notes that I did based on the time that I was allocated but I would appreciate some feedback from from everyone because I think it's a great discussion that we can have and ideas nobody knows everything so it's great to get ideas for from everyone so if anyone has ideas of equipment even if it's the most obvious thing please put it in replace something with something try this try that and 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 let's get all the ideas going so without further ado and wasting more time I, i'm i'm going to go with what i have here but i'm really excited as well to see what everyone else has to 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 give to us um so the obvious the most obvious um equipment because again i didn't know people's experience with it with apa but you know we have tricycles nobody thinks that's an adapted equipment and it is um there's three wheels on it instead of two we have stabilizers on bikes so they're the most obvious equipment that we have and then we can go more in depth into adaptive physical activity and what we have so for me um probably the best piece of equipment i have is a height adjustable table if you have a wheelchair user you can adjust the table to that that person's height so if they have very restricted movement you can you can adapt for that for any tabletop activity that they might do now that's again for severe uh, disabilities um, and i'm going to just talk about badminton um as a sport because we could talk about loads of different sports and give different ad adaptations and progressions for them so for the purpose of this we'll go badminton um, so we have a net in badminton as Paul said we can we can change the space but he's already spoken about that but we have a net that we can adjust higher or lower and um, 
we have um, a racket that um, we can get a bigger head on the racket. Uh, we could get a racket with a bit of flexibility on it, which will be more forgiving when we go to hit the, the object, and I say object and not shuttlecock, because let's say we use a balloon. You know, that's how kids learn to, to catch. I'm sure I'm, I'm not a PE teacher and I, I haven't been, um, but I understand for, for kids, the best way for them to catch a, uh, to learn how to catch is a balloon. It's so slow and it's graceful and it's so much fun. Um, so let's introduce a balloon instead of a shuttle um, with a bigger head that has flexibility. Really, it's so forgiving, you know. Um, then we can change to the regular racket. We can change to the shuttle. So we could have, like in China, Paul, if you wanted to do badminton, you could have 60 people and people doing different things. They'd have big rackets, small rackets, balloons, shuttles, high net, low net, and we're just adapting to the needs of the people in our session. Um, so that, that's just one example, uh, one sport as an example of how we can adapt um, a sport through equipment. Um, for me, inclusivity is a huge part, and um, I, love, I love going skiing, um, and every second year I take a group of people with intellectual disabilities skiing. And from my experience, I have taught people who are visually impaired uh, to ski, um, somebody with um, one leg, somebody who's a wheelchair user, um, and we've taken them up blue slopes, uh, red slopes. They even want to go on black slopes that I wasn't comfortable going on. Um, but like a fantastic piece of equipment, the monoski. To put a person who is a wheelchair user in a monoski and, and ask them, I don't know about you guys, but when I was learning to ski, I found it very difficult. And I have, I can, I can see, I can hear, I've got use of both legs, arms, and I was so nervous. So to see the bravery of some people when they go up, and that's down to the equipment. If that equipment didn't exist, they couldn't take part in that sport. So for me, um, the, in, the inclusivity of having the equipment and letting them to be included in groups, in sports, and mainly in families, like family ski trips are family trips. So you can't say, okay, well, um, my sister's a wheelchair user, she can't go skiing. Of course you can go skiing. We just need the right equipment for her to come skiing. So of all of these, yes, they're all really important, but equipment is massive. If we have the right equipment, people can do everything. They can take part in every sport and we can include them in every session. So brilliant. Louise, so, I could just stop you very briefly. Uh, Kirsty's put a link in there and I think what you said at the start um, uh, when you were introducing equipment is so important that we do share ideas because you know some people may be you know immersed in their sport and their world and very passionate about what they do and not realize that that could be so helpful across a multitude of sports so we've started a link to, um the uk coaching connected coaches and i'll start sharing some of your ideas and i'll encourage oh great yeah to do that um and you know as you're speaking there thinking of you know some of the opportunities when i had 30 children in front of me to say maybe just you know don't yes don't don't use balls inside if you're in a, a a small flat in a in a tower block in London. Let's look at socks. Let's roll a sock up and yeah. what targets can we have? So whether it is a, a PE lesson, a full one to one lesson, um, a large group session, um, planning and asking, you know, kind of what what equipment do they have at home? What do I have? What do I have access to? And how creative people can do so uh, can be. I love that, Louise. Thanks a million. Um, yeah. Just before we move on, any thoughts around people, or do you think you do you think we've covered that? Yeah, just, just quickly with uh, the people. So I mentioned a bit earlier, it's not only about people with the, the disabilities that we are trying to include into our session and into society. We've got mentors. Um, a big part of the Special Olympics movement is um, unified sports where they've got mentors or partners without intellectual disability. And the benefits that they're getting from taking part in that sport can be seen as greater than the benefits of the people with the intellectual disability. So let's not just be adapted um, sport and physical activity as a benefit for people with disabilities or somebody who's different. It's for everyone and everyone can benefit from it. So that's the, the, the main point when it comes to people. Um, how can we make people equal on the playing field? Um, so one example of that, um, Esther might be familiar with it. It's another Paralympic sport. It's called goalball for people who are visually impaired. So regardless of the level of their impairment, they're blindfolded. Their partners are blindfolded. Their teammates, 
everyone on the playing field is blindfolded. So let's make the playing field equal and the person with the disability doesn't have to adapt to the person without the disability. The person without the disability can adapt to the person with the disability. And again, that's down to equipment, i.e. blindfolds. Um, um, and then obviously like people, the, the obvious one is groupings, big groups, small groups, um, people playing with or against people of similar ability to them to make it um, either a composite team or a competitive game. So again, look, we could talk for an hour on it, but I'm going to stop now because I know that. No, no, you're brilliant. Yeah, Thanks. <laughs> link in the last part of that from the group there uh, joy from my experience um, in the boxing world in the last 18 months the vital use of timers um, and the three minute buzz that goes off so actually adding a timer in so learners know how long they have to spend on an activity um, I absolutely love that and then Paul has mentioned more important to ask participants what equipment they feel comfortable with so again linking back as as our Paul here has said before you know understanding the people in front of you and being able to work with what they feel comfortable so that's that return is happening, that ex enjoyable experience is happening. Um, and, you know, as Nick has mentioned, they're changing the size of the playing groups that we have at different levels and age, uh, linking to feedback and reflection and, and how that kind of develops their autonomy and their competency by stopping and pausing and, and having that peer reflection and checking in with each other, not just a, a kind of small plenary around recall, um, which does have its benefits, absolutely. Um, if I could jump to you, Esther, as I know where time is zipping by, you have a sample of a, of a game and some uh, links to the TP part of, of Stepper. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to look at this a little bit differently and, and challenge myself. So, you know, my background is obviously, you know, disability sport and disability athletics. And indeed, I am. Uh, I have got cerebral palsy. And, and one of the things that I've started to do, uh, actually, as a retired athlete, but also as a parent, is to is to help out in tennis. Uh, so if you were going to take somebody um, like myself with coordination problems, balance problems and perception problems, uh, one of the most difficult games that you could probably play is, is tennis. So again, you know, kind of going through my own learning, but also um, working with a, with a club and, and working with, uh, with some brilliant coaches as a parent helper. And, and it's made me realise how much we take the... the um, the different tools of equipment task and, and people and, and steps generally and how much that we can use and, and, and utilize those working with a whole variety of people. So I predominantly now work with uh, youngsters and, and children, which is new to me, um, but also, um, you know, non-disabled children, but again, all of mixed ability groups. Um, and so we have a participation group and those groups are really difficult. Uh, there's not 60 people, um, but you never know who's come in from week to week. You never know whether somebody might turn up and my friend's staying for a weekend or my, my, niece, my uh, cousin's staying. Can they come and join the session? By the way, they've never played before. Um, so for me, and as a, as a coach, this is as challenging, I guess, in terms of looking at, you know, how do we adapt the activities so everybody can, can take part? And so, you know, the ethos, it is a pay and play session. It, it, it's not you know, kind of participate, it's not coaching, it's, it's not even competition, but it is about, we have an ethos of, we will help you to hit the ball, become confident with hitting the ball over the net, and you will have a really good time, uh, you know, and so I've just put some examples of here, and, and some of those will be really obvious, uh, you know, in tennis, they've got different size balls, um, which link to predominantly working with the different age groups, but again, you know, thinking outside the box, um, you know, it doesn't have to be an age group. It can be looking at, let's have a look at the different balls and which ball might be appropriate for you. If you've never hit a tennis ball before, we're going to start with a with a, um, with a red ball or we might even start with a balloon. Uh, we've used balloons, uh, Louise, or we've used a, a big kind of blow up, um, really light football just to get people used to, you know, touching uh, the ball and the racket together. Obviously, the net, we can have a net or not have a net. We can have the net at different heights. Um, so there's, there's lots of different things we can do um, in terms of, I've got a cone. Uh, I'm not very good at drawing, but you can see that that is a cone on there. So one of the first things that we would do is we would put a cone on the floor to help somebody to understand where, where they put their feet when they hit the ball. Because actually when you hit the ball, you want to hit it sideways on. Uh, as somebody progresses, you want to get them into a, a kind of ready position so they can then put their feet in their own in, in the right place themselves. But you know, it's little steps all the time, and it may well be that if you work on.
progresses, then something else falls apart. So one minute you've got your hand-eye coordination right, next minute you're getting mixed up with your feet. And that's just not the little kids, by the way, that, that's me. If you know what I mean? So the ability to, once you've you learned one element, you can go back and change something else. The other interesting thing, I guess, is that we've also got a real problem in the group is that we can't get rid of some people. We, we'd like them to move on. We'd like them to go into the club. And, and, and linking to this slide, actually, looking at the, the kind of different way you step. You know, we've got some people that are really skilled in terms of the, the skills. Um, but actually, what we want them to do is, is to develop some confidence and creativity. So we actually get some of the older players working with the younger players, which work on some of those other elements we, we were just going to talk about. So, yeah, it's a, a whole kind of way that we can use things. But I, I find it absolutely fascinating. And, and I've used STEP in so many different ways working with a mainstream group. Um, I, I absolutely love that, Esther, that you've taken a wealth of experience across a multitude of sports and, and your professional um, career. I've been able to just pick up, you know, in, in the tennis space, some of those skills and transfer them over and um, grow and develop um, with such humility in those as well. Um, so you're fantastic. Having listened to, to your experiences, I, I know you're a fantastic coach. Um, so we're just jumping onto the five C's now. So if I could go to you, I'm very conscious of time, but I think this is a vital part to link to the STEP model. And as Alison has said so greatly, as we're developing people, not just athletes, discussing the changes brought around using STEP is another huge resource. So if you yeah. wouldn't giving us uh, an overview of this, Paul, please. That'd be great. Oh, you're muted there. Sorry, Paul. Sorry. I was just uh, typing away, as you could see in the chat box. <laughs> um, yeah, so the C system is kind of a set of characteristics that we, um, we think all coaches should look to develop with all children. Um, and it's very much focusing on the kind of holistic approach, so touches upon um, a few areas that, that other people have, have mentioned already in, in the chat box. So it's about how do we um, focus on the whole of the child or the person. Um, and if I just touch upon kind of some of these um, and, and perhaps provide a little bit of an example, I think competence we've probably spoken quite a bit about in this conversation today. Um, but if I take confidence as a bit of an example, so how through the STEP model, could we develop um, competence or confidence, sorry? So what we're looking for in, in confidence is to think about how we can affect um, someone's participation. Perhaps it could be about developing confidence to improve their performance or developing confidence to perhaps get a maximum benefit from their actual participation in their, their sport or activity. Uh, and I think with this area, what we're trying to develop is um, is foster a growth mindset. Um, and I think through the steps principle, we can look at how we can um, consider kind of success and challenge. And I think tend to look at in this area a bit of an 80-20 split. So we're trying to make sure that 80% of um, someone's success in a session is is what we're looking to achieve but then there's also that 20 percent of challenge or perhaps failure because that's important too i don't like to necessarily use the word failure but i think it's a good way of kind of explaining um between the 80 20 rule in this area and i think the key is about developing someone's kind of self-worth and, and self-efficacy and obviously steps is is plays a really, really important part in doing that. Um, I think when it comes to kind of connection, how through um, the step concept can we make sure that we're providing the right kind of environment within the session? Um, so that could be achieved through perhaps the people as a bit of an example. So how are we kind of engaging people in kind of small group activities and, and what does that connection look like within that session? And that's going to be very much um, kind of controlled by by the coach and what kind of communication is going to happen in terms of perhaps the task. Uh, another example under connection might be how do you kind of give um, certain individuals within the session a bit more of an official um, role? So they might actually become kind of official in certain um, group activities. 
or um, games that happen perhaps towards the end of a session. Um, and it might be also through um, perhaps the people again, what could we do to ensure that rotation happens within our, our games program so that everyone gets the opportunity to feel part of a team and develops their kind of confidence and, and feels involved in, um, in, in what's happening. Uh, I think Esther made a really good point on kind of character earlier when it came to the step model because um, it, the step model gives a great example. If you can actually teach the, the young people who you're working with to, to understand what the step model means, how can they um, take a bit of ownership and, and empowerment to actually manage things within their session around the step model? so that they feel that they're achieving certain things that they're looking to achieve in the session or, or they're making the session more enjoyable by um, making certain modifications within that session. Um, so yeah, there's just uh, a couple of examples, I think, on how the STEP model can really kind of interlink quite nicely with the C system. So you're not only kind of considering um, it from a, um, inclusive adaptation um, perspective within the session. You're also looking at it from a bit of a holistic pro approach as well. Absolutely. Um, thanks for that a snapshot there. We do have um, a, you know a wealth of resource and information on the step model and the five C's on the website. Uh, earlier on, uh, I think it was Alison mentioned in the group around the duty to care toolkit. We have um, a knowledge check on um, in inclusivity as one of the pillars. I would encourage people to go and get your digital badge, the inclusion element and um, the mental health, well-being, diversity and safeguarding. It's, it's a fantastic resource. I'm not just saying this because I'm you know, inside the team. I think it's absolutely brilliant and it definitely stretched me even though I'm constantly uh, updating my knowledge. I was, I was tested uh, a couple of uh, different times. We have workshops that people can dive into. One of them here listed connecting, thriving, developing your practice and the inclusive um, activity program, the IAP program. So I would encourage everybody to have a look at that. Um, you know, I know we're over time here, but I just can't say enough. Louise, I think you nailed it there when you said we could take the step model alone and go into each of the areas and uh, you know, share our passion. I will ask Louise, Paul and Esther to contribute on the Connected Coaches thread um, after the session today. So please do, if you have any more questions or thoughts on the session, anything you'd like to share. Go to there and we will be engaging and answering some questions and sharing in depth some more examples. We are all about great coaching, what it looks like, feels like, and sharing that and supporting coaches. We're here for the coach at UK Coaching. So the, the, the person-centered approach, the empowering, the organized, positive learning and engaging experience that we try and do, it comes about and whatever model we use um, and whatever incredible guests we have, we're really just trying to share and stimulate some thoughts and, and be there around this changing time. And um, next week, Monday, 2.15, another session. Um, the wonderful Nick Lovett, our head of coaching, he'll be steering the ship there around new season, a new season ahead for, um, for competitions and training. So thank you very much today to everybody who, who's attended. There is an opportunity to watch this back and it will be on that Connected Coaches thread. But without leaving today, I could not stop and say, Paul, Louise and Esther, thank you so much. I know we've only skimmed the surface of your passion and insight, but thank you for taking the time to plan with me and, and to, put, to putting this together for 60 minutes for everybody. So awesome job. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, have a great day, everybody.